How is everybody doing? And welcome back for another Strength Chat episode. Today, I have got a very special guest for you. Today, I'm joined by the founder of Pro Sport Physiotherapy. He's worked with England Rugby League and Rugby Union, as well as being a mentor to physios around the UK and, in fact, around the world. Today, I am joined by the one and only Dave O'Sullivan. How are you doing? Hey, Stephen. Thanks for, for having me. Great to be here. No worries at all. Thanks a lot for taking the time to, to jump on. Um, how, how have you been? What have you been up to? What's been happening in your world? Um, yeah, so I've just come out of um, the, the summer uh, camp with, with England Rugby Union. So we, we, uh, we beat uh, USA and Canada uh, in, in, a, in a couple of games. So it was good to obviously uh, get the wins with them. So just kind of decompressing after camp life. Um, and just kind of focusing more again on the uh, on the, the mentoring and the uh, the private practice. So kind of in between uh, camps at the moment, which is nice. Nice. Do do you sort of do half, especially with the mentoring side of things? Is that a lot more online now? Um, obviously with, with COVID, or is the plan to do some some in person? Um, and what's it like getting back in terms of you know with sport getting back up and running and, and being involved with things in person again? Yeah, it's it's really good. Um, so the yeah to answer your question, the a lot of it's been online, uh, but we we do plans to get the we like we used to have refresher courses where the therapists would come in person. Um, so we were we're in the process of planning those events now. Just wanted to see how kind of things unfolded with all the the releasing of the restrictions. So I uh, got to get them back up and running soon as well. But yeah, it is it's good to. Uh, it's good to be back into some kind of normality um, and, and just, yeah, just getting into the, uh, into clubs and stuff like that as well. Working with clubs again as well has been, been really good to, um, as I said, just, just feel a bit normal again, if, if, if it will ever get back to normality, I don't know, but it's close yeah. to it. I think that, I think that's the thing. I mean, I, I know obviously with, with gyms uh, being back open, it, it seems as though everything's going, going back to normal, but I think there's always that, um, nervousness in case of it, it does does all does all change again. I know we've you know a lot of the um, a lot of sort of like the athletes and clients who are playing sports, you know, especially on the rugby you know side of things. With that starting back up in September, I think everyone's excited to get back, um, but just hoping that you know it continues it continues rather than you know the disruption that it, that, it, that it's caused over the um, the last year the year and a bit. Um, so obviously I did a little bit of a bit of an introduction there, um, but for everyone listening who might not know your background, how you got involved in physiotherapy and, you know, working with the teams that, you, that you've that you worked with and the practice that you've set up, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I always say I wasn't smart enough to do physio in Ireland, so I, I came over to uh, Huddersfield. I, I went the long way around, done two years in Carlow in, in Ireland, done physiology, health science then went to Huddersfield uh, I think it was the only place I actually got accepted uh, so it was kind of a <laughs> process of elimination there um, but it worked out all right and then yeah done that then uh, I got some placements with uh, with Bradford Bulls and Leeds Rhinos uh, as a, a student and then got offered a job with Leeds Rhinos when I qualified luckily um, so worked for them for a few years then I uh, went back to Ireland to, with Munster uh, Rugby Union uh, but my wife now at the time was still in Huddersfield uh, so came back to Huddersfield uh, took up the Huddersfield Giants job done that for a few years then my second daughter was born so I kind of wanted to come out of a professional sport uh, full time so then I, I stepped out started the mentoring uh, side of it as well because there was a lot of kind of therapists asking me uh, for that kind of um, service I suppose if you want to call it that um, and then um, was lucky then to work with um England Rugby League uh, for the 2017 World Cup, uh, then done bits with Warrington Wolves, uh, Hull FC, uh, Leicester Tigers, and and uh, very lucky to work with England Rugby Union as well uh, for the last few years on a, on a kind of consultancy basis. So um, that's kind of rugby side, then uh, work with golfers and um, kind of motor, motor sport athletes as well, and, and, and bits and pieces as well. So kind of very, very good variety, which is, which is, I suppose, what I like nowadays, the, the freedom rather than the, the, the uh, constraints of professional sport full time. That's, it's nice to have that kind of freedom and mixture now. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. And do you find that, especially working with like the, the elite sport, having that little bit of variety, it keeps you on your toes a little bit or do you find similar things, you know, across the board? Because especially when you, when you mentioned there about sort of motorsports, that's kind of like, 
I would think it's completely different to, you know, working with the the rugby side of things. So do you find that a lot more interesting now, having that bit more variety? Yeah, definitely. I think there with with uh with those guys, so like, like the a lot of them were like um on on the bike. So it was it was learning, you know, little bits about kind of the postures they had to withstand and and you're kind of you a lot of that was new, but you know, I always joke it's the same nervous system, it's the same muscle, same uh reactions. And and actually a lot of them have very similar um issues, but I think I suppose it's the the rehab and the positions they need to tolerate will be slightly different to golfers to to rugby players. So that that bit of it's good to that you kinda you you have to kinda force yourself to think a little bit rather than just kind of giving them the same same stuff all the time. Yeah, definitely. And you and you mentioned there as well, um, you know, uh, other um uh, physios were, were asking sort of like for a mentoring role. Was that something that you ever thought about as you kind of progressed through your career or was it kind of like a natural progression if 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 you like? Because from athletes that I've spoken to, you know, is that um I always ask, is it was that a natural progression? To get into coaching, but I suppose from a from a coach's role to then coach other coaches or you know mentor other other physios, was that something that you'd all, you'd, you'd looked at, or like I say, it was just a natural progression? Yeah, I think um, yeah. I mean, I, I'd always have kind of therapists reaching out to me and asking me, you know, bits and pieces of advice, and can they kind of come and, and shadow us and stuff? So, um, I to be honest, it was more. I, I said I'd do it for a year because I wanted to come out of professional sport. So I was still building up the private practice at that time. So I almost done it just to almost replace my income from the professional sports. So I said, "Fuck it, I'll try it for a year." Um, and to be honest, I thought I'd only do it for a couple of years. Um, and yeah, I'm a bit shocked really at, at kind of how it's grown so quickly um you know and 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 the kind of people all over the world we have on it now it's it's uh it's mad I, I still pitch myself sometimes so the the honest answer is i thought i'd do it for a year or two um but it, just in terms of your point there I, I think it's it's really good i've definitely improved because when you have to teach stuff and you have to simplify it it's definitely helped me in my head as well um you know and, and the questions you get asked and uh you know people challenge you it's i think it's really good because it you, you can't bullshit really if you know if, if you have all these people kind of you know questioning you and then you know you, you know yourself you put stuff out as well online and, and there's always someone ready to knock you down or, or have a go and stuff like that so it's uh it's been good for me to clarify clarify my thoughts my structure my system and i found actually since i started like when i started in 2015 the system that i was teaching was very complicated and it was only actually when i had to get out of what was in my head and help other people be successful with it it's actually it's simplified so much, you know, in, in 2021 and beyond now, and it's continuing to get more more easy. So I think that's that was an interesting thing as well as and uh, and the more I simplified it for other people, I simplified the approach in terms of what I was doing and and almost getting better results. So you kind of work in half the the amount or complicating it half as much as as I probably was doing back then, you know. Yeah. Oh, cool. And and from that, because I always like to ask ask this question as well. You know, when you said there, you know, only wanted to do it a, a year, and then and then it, it's grown a, a little bit from there. From you know the the clubs that you've worked with and the progression through your career, and now you mentoring other physios. Who were kind of your biggest influences on your career when you when when you were starting out? Because as you were talking there, we have an internship program at the uh, at the gym, and from myself starting out to then me trying to pass on you know uh, some knowledge or, or experience onto other people I look back and think about you know who influenced me when I first started coaching so who were your sort of biggest influences you know when you were you know working with other teams and, and working in sport and, and developing through your career yeah um there there was a my first um kind of head physio that I worked under or in a full-time law was a guy called Myron Jones uh so he's he was a lead rhinos physio at the time and I'll always say I was so lucky to to have him kind of guide me and and show me stuff that kind of put me down the path that I I essentially went down um because physio so you know it's it's I'll be honest the physio profession it, it's so hit and miss and everyone's got an opinion but actually especially professional sport all that matters is you can get results yeah. um so he was kind of he helped me didn't you know didn't mince his words and show me ways that i could get results with athletes and then um you know i'd like to think i've evolved 
my thought process now I'm starting to take for myself, but he, he was, uh, you know, unbelievable. And he had um, a partner as well, who was um, with the Bradford Bulls at the time, Martin Higgins, who he's based in Leeds. Uh, and he, he was excellent as well for me. Um, you know, the two of them, um, very uh, open to hands-on treatment, show me some good techniques, but also very open to strength training and, and the value of getting, getting guys strong. Um, so kind of got a big interest in S&C from an early days. And uh, I'd said the two of them were, were the the biggest ones. And, you know, if, if I ever got stuck now as well, I'd, I'd still, I'd go to probably Myron. He's with uh, Melbourne Storm Rugby League at the moment. So, you know, I'd still chat to him if I had a tricky hammy or, or something or, you know, something even that I didn't see before. I'd go, oh, what's your thoughts on this? And, He's a great air to, to bounce around as well because he's, he's still in day-to-day professional sport as well. So that's that's great to, to have that person. Um, so I'd say the two of those guys were probably the, the biggest uh, influence early doors. Yeah. Oh, cool. And I think it's good to have that network as well and still, you know, be able to have those, have those conversations and, you know, be able to have that support that if you do need help or just need to, um, maybe even just double check and think, you know, this is this is what I'm thinking. You know, what would what 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 would you do? Um, and one you mentioned there about, uh, you know, getting results with uh, with athletes and sometimes uh, physiotherapy can be a little bit hit or miss. That actually, you know, flows quite nicely into the into the next or the first question that I had in mind, and that's from sort of. Um, because sometimes you know you hear athletes or you hear clients that have sometimes mentioned um or i've been told it's this but i haven't been told how to get from point a to point b or get back to playing so from your sort of uh, first assessment what does the process look like to actually finding a solution um, a, a long-term solution to, to get the results and get them back performing and what are sort of the stages that you go through to get to that end goal? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So uh, I think a lot of therapists probably, you know, were, were guilty and I was certainly in the early days of just treating session to session and not having a plan. Um, and that, that's, you know, a big part of what we teach in the, in the mentorship and, you know, we, we do have um, like personal trainers, strength coaches to deal with people in pain as well. Um, on it and and we, we teach the exact same thing to them just to kind of you know make this more specific for your listeners and and that is getting really clear on what that person wants to get back to and you know it's, it's like the first session for you guys it's okay why are they coming into the gym they're coming into the gym so that they can do something else and and that's what they're coming to us for and i think we're certainly guilty of you know almost pushing this all oh, weak glutes you need to strengthen your glutes you strengthen your core the reality is people don't really care about that they what they really care about is the is what we call internal motivators of what's the reason they come to us in the first fit, first place what motivated them to come and i think they're at the first session they're really high with that but as session two three four comes on they forget that a little bit. So I think that needs to be the forefront of everything you do so that you're constantly reminding them of that. Um, and that that's going to be big into the motivation. But then to kind of answer your question, it all starts with that thing. And whatever they want to get back doing, we have to reverse engineer. And it all, because that's the highest level of graded exposure they, they need to get to. But we probably want to go a little bit higher just as that, you know, that buffer or that, that kind of security blanket so they can tolerate that load. And is it, speed of movement that they need to be able to tolerate as well as just strength what's the movements and you know everyday life it's got to be some squat lunge you know in in tree planes of motion so uh very much reverse engineer back from that really um and we'll draw it out on on paper for them the the steps a b c d up to f and i'll always say you know you can't go from a to f we we have to build it up that the biggest mistakes to see is when we jump too quickly the nervous system reacts usually with, with pain or we lose range of motion or, or something like, like that, or, or you get a tightness somewhere um, or an unpleasant experience, if you, if you want to call it that. So uh, lay that all out to them and, and give them clarity. And I, I think that's the big thing, even in professional sport, is people, they, we as professionals, healthcare professionals, we assume they know, but actually they, you know, it was interesting. My dad went to a therapist in Cork and, you know, I, I set him up with a therapist that, that I trust and, you know, he came and he had a million questions for me. And he said, like, you know, he said this, this and this. And, you know, it was it was really eye opener for me because he went in there and he's just like a, a there in headlights, really. Like there's so much information coming to him in that, you know, half an hour, 40 minute session that they, they, they don't process it at all. And I think that's the bit where we almost assume, well, I told them that first session, but 
people don't process it so that's why i think there's a lot of value in writing out just uh like a, a map almost you know the milestones they need to hit they can take that away and they can review it and they have clarity and then every session we need to go back to that and go this is where you are now this is where we're going in the next session and i think giving them that that clarity of where they're going that they've made progress it's good to see actually yeah i've come from here to here but there's more progress to be made i think that's a big part of the um of the the buy-in and the adherence to your your rehab your exercises and everything you give them it has to relate back to that internal motivator that you know that northern stars we, we say sometimes of where they want to get back to so a lot of it's non like whether it's you or me doing it it's not a physio skill it's just people skills um and i think that's the bit that um that uh, a lot of people struggle with is uh is actually just helping the person understand and, and give them clarity um as well i think so important so that that's my process in the first session to be honest it's because if they don't have that you're not going to get the buy-in they don't understand why they're doing their exercise they'll do them for a little bit but motivation will drop and you're, you're pissing against the wind end so that's that's my first priority with, with the sessions you have to get buy-in from the patient because if you don't have buy-in you know or, or adherence then you, you you know you're your backs up against the wall trying to get results yeah, there, there were kind of two things that you mentioned there, especially when you mentioned your um, your dad going to go see a, a physio, and the main thing was sort of you know trust and buying, and you sort of summed it up there in terms of in terms of relationships because it is one of those things of you know you um uh, this could be the worst analogy in the world but i had a I had a conversation about it. it's the same as when you're going to get your hair cut you know who do you, who do you trust to get your get your hair cut and you know at the start how do you how do you get those results and building off from what you said there sort of two questions two questions that i had in mind is when you were going in and or when athletes are coming in or clients are coming in and they're a little bit like a deer in the deer in the headlights like what, you, what you've mentioned do you think sometimes because you know physios the the they're expected to get results that they try and give sort of you know short term solutions and try and give them something that's just kind of a a quick fix rather than you know having a having a a long term a long term progression and plan that you've mentioned or do the short term solutions serve a purpose for now so that you can work on you know the other things that you need to work on to get them to where where they want to be to keep that motivation up if that kind of makes sense yeah no that's a great question uh, i think the the simple answer is there is you need a bit of both um because and and they will tie in together because if, if the person's in a lot of pain and we, we learned this in the heart with my own clinic is it's all well and good giving them the plan and going like so we've got a i'm not sure familiar but like i've got an 80 20 rule so my 80 percent of my time is spent on what's not doing its job and then 20 percent of our time is probably spent on the symptoms or the area where the pain is and then as i said 80 percent is like right what else isn't doing its job and, and really focusing on that but on if the person's sitting there in a lot of pain and we're trying to get the 80 percent to do its job but the pain is just causing is taking all our attention then we we do need to change something there um you know quickly so so there is that balance and i think a lot of a lot of that will differ between your the type of person coming in so a lot of acute people they'll probably crave uh short-term relief whereas people who have had pain for a long time and they've been around the houses they're more interested in in the the long term, long lasting because they've been there where they've they've you know they've got manipulated, they've got the massage, they've got the the physio, they've tried stuff, and and they they're more educated about short term results and they they crave long term. So I think it's knowing your patient, knowing what they're looking for is is important with that. But I definitely think you know because you can do some exercises, but if if they're getting pain in the symptoms, that's craving their attention, then it's going to be hard to, to build up the low tolerance to the rest of it so i think you need that um that balance between as i said getting some short-term results but ultimately it, for me it's about having clarity and where you're going long term with the patient and communicating that to them as well and and them understand we use some simple analogies in in the mentorship about you know we're very clear on okay this is where you're at this is where we want to get you to and then we also put in a middle diagram and we're going to go this is usually what happens when your pain starts to go down but there's still a little bit of work to be done um, in order to get you to, to where we want to get you, where, you know, we'd say resilience or, or they can actually tolerate load and, and put weight on the bar in your world and, and maintain the range of motion and maintain the, the mobility and, and the, the sensation of, of a, a pain-free experience. Yeah. 
Do you think with, especially with just, you know, staying on the topic of the of the sort of like short-term solutions and, the, you know, these exercises that are going to relieve pain, do you think that's sometimes where physios potentially go wrong? Because if it if it relieves, relieves pain, you know, straight away, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, th- you know, thanks for that. And then, you know, the athletes, the clients are still going to, still going to come back and you touched on it right at the start, you know, going session by session. Do you think that's where some physios go, go wrong and sort of, you know, from the physios point of view, relying on these quick, on, on, on these quick fixes. And do you think that is, you know, a, a lack of knowledge or a lack of experience or maybe even a lack of confidence in, you know, trying other things and, and having patience in the plan that they've put in place? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's, the, there's a few parts that ask that answer. I think the first bit is, I think we can get addicted to the dopamine hit of getting that quick change. And we, we almost, uh, we, we, we get addicted to the, the, the wow, you know, you're, you're changing thing. But the, the, the big kind of test for me um, is always in professional sport because, as I said, I, I can do that stuff. And I know when they go down to the pitch, when they come back in, there's nowhere to hide because I'm going to be still there. It's grand and private practice. You won't see them for a week. You've got a bit of time, but you can't bullshit in, in professional sport. And, and that's where the, the short-term fixes, they, you know, as I said, you, you can appease them for an hour, but, but it'll be back again. And that's where it's, uh, it, for me, I think it's dangerous. I think it's, uh, it, it can be dangerous for private practice patients as well, where they, you know, and, and a lot of what happens from my experience with hands-on treatment in particular, or, or even some of these kind of techniques where you, you know, you pull your airlobe and, and you get an increase in your range of motion and, you know, distracting the nervous system, the more you do it, the less novel that experience is for the nervous system and then the less changes you get. And that was certainly my case at the start when I was, you know, triggering the glutes or the QL and I was getting this change and then, you know, they felt relief for an hour or two or even a day or two. And then they came back the next week and then the pain, I was good for a day, but then the pain came back and then you do the same things again, but it wasn't helping as much this time, but you've done the exact same thing. And I think that was the bit that I really got frustrated with it, both in sport and private practice was that, you know, as I said, it's because it's the nervous system we're, we're playing with. It's so easy to change it because you can distract it. You can do hundred one. And I've like, I've studied eye training techniques. Uh, I think like the guys, I don't know if you're familiar with like Z health, like we we've had Z health trainers come in and that's the good thing about sport is you, you can get all these people, DNS, all these people coming in and everyone's got their way to, to change things. But the, the ultimate thing is right. Can they go out and train? keep the gains and then get to the next level. And that was when, you know, I almost, I went around the whole courses thing and I just got sick of it all and just went, you know, actually when I, when I simplify all this, it's just created exposure and it's tolerance to load. And it's just basically showing the nervous system it's safe and then giving it a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and doing things at the right time. And, and that's where it's, it's an art rather than a science um, in, in some regards where it's known when to push and when to back them off and, and, that comes with experience as well. Like you, you said with the, the interns and the apprentices coming into the, uh, into the gym, you know, I, I think, and I think that's a problem these days as well is there's so many therapists online that haven't gone through this process, but they've almost gone to fame overnight with on yeah. social media and stuff like that, but they haven't actually earned their stripes and that's dangerous as well. Um, you know, and it, it, as I said, anyone can change things for a couple of sessions, but it's the ability to bridge the gap from, session three or we call it the third fourth session slump where all of a sudden all these techniques aren't so you know magic and wonderful anymore they're 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 not so novel can you bridge that gap from there to the to the high level stuff and actually train lift weights and keep the gains and and that's the bit i see a lot of people struggle with yeah definitely one thing that you mentioned there especially you know having you know fame overnight as well i think there was um somebody put out uh the the mcgill uh big three to help with the to, to help with low, lower back pain um and there was a, a, a follow-up from that saying that you know the, the mcgill big three act isn't going to help everybody yeah the good the good exercises but you know just doing those and giving it a blanket approach you know you might get a few clicks or likes and say oh yeah that's, that's really helpful that helped my back but sometimes you need to you know work with the person that might have some underlying issues that might have some other things that you need to need to work on just saying you know doing those things rather than you know working with 
10, 20, however many people you've worked with to realize, right, okay, it worked for some people, didn't work for others. And this is how it, this is how it needs to, this is what I need, need to work on. And the other thing that I wanted to, wanted to touch on there, which might be a little bit of a, little bit of a tangent, but two questions there in terms of, you know, from working in a, a elite sport and having an understanding and not just focusing on these quick fixes or doing loads of other courses, how much of an influence has it been working with the strength and conditioning coaches to get a better understanding of sort of their world, if you like, and how you can, how you can work together. And then from the, the, uh, the, the physio side of things, kind of a case of when we're trying to, when you said there, you can't, you can't bullshit when you work, when, when you, when you're working with athletes, because they might have worked with three or four physios bef- before you. Um, do you think sometimes, you know, that's what's, uh, is going to keep you on your toes because you know that they've had that exposure or they've they've worked with other physios and they can be a little bit well. Um, this is what I've done before, so this is this is what I need to do now and struggle, you know, changing things around when working with athletes. Yeah, two two really good questions there. I, I think the second question is probably the, the easiest to answer, so I'll do, I'll do that first. Um, I think with that, yeah, you you have to be careful to respect what they feel they need as well. And sometimes you have to kind of appease them to a point, but for me, results speaks, you know, louder than words. And if, if you can make them feel good and feel confident and feel good on the pitch, they'll buy in, you know, and, and you'll sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll laugh and joke. I saw some of the actually dry nose players I worked with, you know, at a charity match with Rob Burrow last a few weeks ago. And, you know, they used to hate doing the pre ab stuff that we we're doing. And then they'd win Jim on a Monday, Tuesday, but Friday night before the game, you see the fuckers doing it, you know, and that's because it made them feel good. And, and they knew it made them feel good. And you saw us laugh and joke about that. So I think, yeah, if you can get results, they'll buy in, you know, and, and, and that's the big thing is, you know, you, you have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And um, so on that part of it, yeah, you, I, I, I think you have to be very respectful of other physios and, and I hate, like, it's so easy. Like people will try bashing me all the time. It's so easy to bash someone, but I, I'm very conscious that I've no idea what they're trying to do with that. So if they're using a Miguel exercise, I've no idea what their clinical reasoning is for using that. Yeah. And, and it's so easy to bash somebody down without actually understanding the thought process. So I'm very, uh, mindful of that because I've seen that happen to me and especially you know as well when you work with international teams there's that whole club physio as well that you have to, to be be careful with so very very aware of that in terms of the second part um, it kind of goes back to what we we're talking about already is uh, for me as a physio the, the best organizations I've worked with the SNC and the physio we we all work as as one really and and that graded exposure the, the SNC program is part of that because if we get them to a point that then they go into the gym and they lift like shit or they don't take what we're trying to do. So essentially all I'm trying to do really is prepare them for the SNC. So the SNC can do what they need to do with them to ultimately get them to the, to the last step, which is perform to the best of their ability. So I wouldn't have done my job if I don't understand what the SNC want to do with them, because that's going to be a big part of what I'm preparing the athlete to get back to. Uh, so the key lifts that to do in the gym, um, the stuff that they, they do on the field and a lot of the return to play and rehab there's obviously a lot of crossover so like I'm massive into deceleration work and the SNC with England Rugby Union are as well and um, the lifts that they do and the, the cues they've certainly bought into a lot of the stuff that like my thoughts and beliefs and, and vice versa and then I've taken bits that they've they use and I've put that into my rehab because I know they need to be able to do it. So I think, you know, it is that, you know, there, there's no kind of um, definite, here's the physio ending, here's the SNC starting. But if you look at the physio and SNC as a graded exposure, and that's why I really like that uh, kind of thought process of we're just exposing them to load. And, and I'm very much, you know, it's like Franz Bosch, he was a big influence on me. And I see a lot of my stuff as the, the sub-maximal stuff to get ready for his stuff. I think his stuff's great, but I think a majority of rugby players I've seen, they're not ready for a lot of it because they just cheat. They, they find ways around it. It's uh, it's very, very high level. So if I can bridge the gap and get them ready so that they can use his drills and then get the most out of it, then the, you know I've certainly done a, a good bit of my job there. So that's the way I see the physio on the S&C. Um, it should be one really, but it should be just a, a graded exposure you know, in, in terms of day one. The, the 21 or, or whenever they're, they're getting back on field and, and they're, they're getting close to returning. 
Yeah, definitely. I think everything needs to be pushing in the in the right direction. You know, there's been a common theme that we've mentioned throughout this chat of um, results are going to speak at, at, at the end of the day. Rather than pulling against each other, it's a case of having having that understanding and then and then, and then work it, working together from there. In terms of the, um, you know, the uh, how you're when we're talking about you know working together, is it a case of some physios are uh, uh, conflict against each other on, on on a little bit of a tangent and you know kind of because we touched on it a little bit in terms of you know we don't want to skip from step A to step F we want to work through the processes is it sometimes a case of you know where potentially some physios may go wrong or what you've experienced with the with the mentoring that you do that they're a little bit reluctant to to step into the strength conditioning world and maybe because there's that there's that thought process, isn't there, that, you know, for uh, when it comes to injuries, you can do, uh, if you do too much, you're going to get you're gonna, you're gonna get injured. If you do too little, you, you, you're you going to get injured. And do you think sometimes there's that tendency to maybe wrap them up in cotton, cotton wool a little bit rather than, you know, uh, maybe push them a little bit more and be like, right, actually, what's the task that we need to do? Let's do that rather than regressing it too much and then actually struggling, taking it longer out, out of the game, if you like. Yeah, definitely. I think that's probably a big fair for a lot of physios when when they come on board the mentorship. They like because we we're very clear on what they're what stresses them, what they don't like doing, and then how can we support them to get results for them. So I'm very aware of what what uh, therapists struggle with. So that is one of them that that we do see is a lot of them will will say that they're not they're they're worried they're not being aggressive enough. Yeah, um, and then. On the other hand, a lot of them are worried that the athlete might flare up again, a breakdown. They don't know if they're ready to go back running. So that's the that kind of um, lack of clarity for for a therapist, so to speak. So I think that that definitely is um, is a big one. And um, we've got in module twelve in the mentorship. It's all about in the gym. So it's all about deadlifts, uh, squats, and and how we can use foot pressures to give the athlete good movement variability and keep the key principles of the mentorship from bridging the gap. So kind of, you know, in terms of our world and how I bridge the gap into S and C, you know, module one is all about, you know, and, and this is the same for you guys. You, you can use this principles as module one is clear understanding where they want to get to what's in their injury history that we're going to have to probably undo some motor adaptations modules two to five is let's get clear on what's not doing its job. And then give that an ability to, to tolerate low to submaximal levels. Module seven and eight then is bridging the gap from low to high level rehab. So a lot of hopping, stuff like that, so that they're ready for the plyometrics la- later on. Then module 11 is the deceleration stuff. So um, both, you know, um, the, the high level uh, hopping progressions, but also then actually the ability to accel and decel and challenger basis support but but also use the the whole body and then 12 then is actually when we get them into the gym now we can lift we don't have to wait till they go through the full system i always that's the question i always get what they can essentially lift whenever we we feel it's safe to to lift but we can use what i would call like top down cues where we're we're coaching them to you know as like for example as the squat we want the weight to go to the heels and then as they come out of the squat we want the weight to go to the midfoot so we can actively get the athlete thinking about that maybe halfway through the rehab. But by the end of the rehab, I want to, you know, it's this kind of classic Louis Gifford phrase, a tallest, fairless movement. I don't want them thinking about that. I want that happening automatically. So there's ways we can manipulate the, the strength training, but definitely we want the strength training in there as soon as possible. But the step before that, which is kind of modules two to five, it's the ability to build tension. And, and that's the key bit that certainly from my time with Leeds where I was hands-on and I was strength I realized working from Munster and Huddersfield that the at sub-maximal levels the nervous system is really good at finding ways to avoid load in certain tissues so you know you'll see this with an ACL and he'll uh, he'll go squatting and he'll shift his weight over to one side that's that's you know a pretty obvious motor adaptation where the brain is shitting itself to load the, the injured knee so it, it shifts all his weight I actually see that a lot and, you know, I started to see that a lot and pay a lot more attention in Huddersfield on a very uh, subtle basis. And and that's one of the big things we we kind of teach in the mentorship now is is spotting those things and, and on doing all of these things on a micro level without being too pedantic about it and then putting them into, then getting them into the positions, 
you know, where they can deadlift and actually tolerate the load. Because from my experience, if you put the weight on the athlete too quickly, they're like, they're really good at finding ways to cheat and work around it. And that might be something like where they'll excessively arch their back or they'll, they'll put their knee, their knee will maybe go in a little bit or grow a little bit because it wants to void. So it might go out because it wants to void loading the big toe, or it might go in because it wants to use your adductor magnus a little bit more because your hip can't do enough. So all these kind of cheats, I think we're very quick to say that's because of a weak glute med or that's because of a weak core but actually it's not that it's the nervous system's finding a way to get the job done and what we need to do then is go back and go right why is that happening specific for this person and that's the bit that i try teach you know therapists and strength coaches now is not to jump in straight away and go his knee caved in there he's got a weak glute med actually it could be a number of things there um and and the answer always lies in module one which is the patient or the person's story what's in their previous injury history. Um, and, and usually they'll avoid loading something there or that, and that's where we kind of want to fill that gap. And then when we get them into the strength and on the back end, that's usually where they'll, they'll do very well then and they'll build that resilience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's where it goes back to what we were saying about blending the strength conditioning world and the, uh, and the physio world, because especially from there, from, from, from what you chatted about, it's the, there might be other things going on, but you want the gym to complement their training and to all uh, their the on-field performance, but also to you know help them get back to load tolerance and, and all those sort of things. So spending time to address that, you know, you might not have that opportunity because you know come you know in season, it's all about the performance on the on the day, you know, on on, on the weekend or anything. So actually, you know, you can you can address a, a couple of other things that you know I'll, I'll, I'll probably think from there. Well, yeah. What, sorry. Sorry. I, yeah, I was just gonna say. I always say I, I I don't even know if I fucking made up this or <laughs> this kind of phrase or if I robbed it. Probably robbed it. But move well on in the gym. Move well on the field. Mm -hmm. And you know that's that's a principle that I live by. And you know if they're moving well in the gym, and that's what I saw at Leeds early doors is if like we actually spent myself and Myron we spent a lot of our time as physios in the gym and educating the players. We gave the SNC a hand with the players and actually coached them. And we found that when they started to lift better in the gym, our injury rates went down and they, they got a lot more durable and resilient. So, you know, I, I think that's, um, it's a massive part of it. And if we can get a moving well in the gym, you know, it, it's, it's doing the physio a favor. Plus it's also going to help their performance on the, on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of those things of, you know, yes, you know, you want athletes to be to be strong and, and, and powerful. Uh, and then it goes, this could be a again, this could be a massive tangent that I go on now. But it's a little bit like with the um the the sort of like strength lifts, whether it's squat bench or deadlift or you know, the uh, the Olympic lifts on, you know, for cleans or anything like that. Yes, you know, you don't want them to be power lifters, you don't want them to be weightlifters. But you still want them to have to have good to have good technique, and that whole you know thought process of injury in, injury prevention. You know, there's a lot more things that you can add in to be like you know it, how do you put you can't prevent an injury until, um, until it happens. You know, you don't know, but you can put the foundation there to make sure that, right, okay, I'm, I've covered all the bases so that, you know, I'm going to make sure that the gym is a place where we're getting them stronger and fitter and, and faster to try and reduce that, that injury risk as, you know, as, as much as we can. Um, a couple of things that you mentioned, especially when you've mentioned, you know, working with uh, international teams, working with club teams, and also, you know, you know the, the, the general population or, or, or you know, low, lower level athletes. In terms of, you know, the thought process on the amount of time that you need to need to spend with them and maybe, you know, uh, how quickly you go through, go through that process, is it a case of, you know, the amount of time that you would spend with international athletes like the camp that you were in that, that you were in, in in recently? How does that differ to then spending an entire season with a with a club, if that makes sense? Because when you're with a club, you've you've got that a lot more time with them. You're seeing them week in, week out at training. Whereas then going into an international camp, it's just a short period. How does that work when they're coming from other clubs when there's physios? And then your experience of working in a, in a club environment yeah it's, it's it's interesting that like and i would actually probably say it's the opposite to what you kind of alluded to, to there is on camp when you're in camp you have a lot more time because you're you're right. with them from 6 30 a.m to probably 7 p.m 8 p.m 9 p.m so you've got a bit more time you've nothing else to do so you're 
you're kind of you you've got time to do that. Whereas in a club, the players usually they, they'll come in, they'll train, and then they're gone. So you you've kind of got a small window, and then the club physios. I always feel sorry for the club physios because they've got probably fifty odd players in rugby union, for example, as in a squad. You know, a few physios, and they're you know you can only ever give them like maybe a half an hour to forty minutes, and then there's something else going on, and like they're playing with bits, and then you've got your rehab or so. Club, club, uh, club is challenging, and you, you actually, you know, the ideal world is yeah, we do this, this, and this, but the reality is, and that's where like the Twitter world's hilarious when they're you know, they're saying, Oh, you should be doing this, this, and this. It's like, where, where are you getting the time for that? Yeah. Um, because it's it's something that you know, ideally, it sounds great, but reality is completely different. Whereas in camp, it's a smaller squad, and as I said, it's a longer day, so you you, you tend to have more time where you can you know, put, put a bit of effort in and cause half of it's, it's actually like coaching the, the players and having the time to coach them and being able to take them away for a half an hour uninterrupted without a big group, you know, that that's invaluable. Um, whereas in, in club, it's just, you know, a lot of the times you're just fighting fires. You're just getting them out there week to week and, you know, it, it's hard to make, make long-term changes. Um, so I think that that's probably the the big difference there. I've I've kind of taken it off on tangent. I've got the actual question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's all right. It was it was just you know the the whole spectrum of how much time you you, you spend with that because you touched on it there. You know that actually being able to take you know uh, athletes to one side and a lot of it is you know the 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 coaching the coaching side of it and showing them what you do and that you know that's what we touched on in terms of. The last question, which was, you know, being in being in the gym and, you know, picking up on other things and, and, and you know, making sure that they're actually coming out the end of it with, you know, an extra skill set. Because obviously what they might have been doing at the start maybe led to that injury or led to those niggles or, you know, those short term fixes that we that, that we've mentioned, all those short term solutions, you know, the novelty of, has worn off from that. And in terms of the. Just building on that, you know, some of the the myths surrounding that from a from an athlete, you know, point of view. Why do you think sometimes, or from the athletes that you worked with and from your experience, why do you think athletes get, you know, too dependent on certain exercises or or, or on certain things? Even from a from from your point of view, it might not actually like they don't need it anymore. But why do you think sometimes people, you know, gravitate towards things and think, right, I need I need this done, or maybe even you know look to other physios that are gonna you know give that give them that, even though where you think actually no, in the plan that we've laid out, which we chatted about at the start, is you know we we can move on from there now. We need to progress. We don't need to you know keep referring back to these exercises. If that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question as well. I think um, a lot of it, they they get that dopamine of that short term makes them feel good. So whether it's, you know, you use a band around your hip or your ankle, you get that increase in ankle mobility short term, you know, it makes them feel good. A, a lot of it is is routine as well. And I don't necessarily think sometimes if they're not dependent on a physio for, you know, you're constantly doing the same hands on treatment um, as for me, uh, if it gets the game day and they want something to do and I appease them, um, but certainly during the week, you know, if they're jumping on to get the same thing and they don't need it, I, I kind of tell them I have that conversation or I'll give them some stuff to do actively. Go do that first. Then if you feel you need it, come and see me. And and that's the kind of um, the, the bit I think that I can tolerate is, you know, I, what, what I, I don't have any tolerance for and I don't like is this passive you know, where they, they don't want to do anything actively. They just want to jump on the bed and, and later. And, you know, we there was a joke actually in the, in the camp. One of the players commented, he goes, he he liked his, his massage and stuff, which is absolutely fine. He, he joked, he goes, every time I see him, uh, a player with you, they're, they're always up doing some rehab because the way I treat is I'll do a little bit of hands-on, retest, graded exposure, rehab exercise or whatever it is, back on the bed, do a bit more. And I'll be you know, we'll be constantly moving. So it's not just the 30 bit of the point where you're going to be lying on the bed. It'll be very active. That That's kind of how I treat. Um, so, so that kind of side of it, I think is important, but what I probably encourage them to do at the end of the, the rehab cycle is to find a pre-training routine that works for them. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it's very much may, whatever makes you feel good going into the session is good. And then it's it, for me, then it's them developing that, whether it's emotional intelligence, whether that's the right word of, if you feel a little bit stiffer on a certain day, then yeah, you need to do a couple more sets of it. If you feel good in a certain day, bang out a set of it, move on. 
you know, and, and it's them getting that awareness of their body then and what they actually need to feel good. They do all that and then they still need a little bit, then come see me. You know, I, I don't have too much of a of a of an issue with with that side of it. Yeah. Is there a difference or do you find a difference between, you know, athletes who have had, you know, a few more years in the game, if you like, you know, and have had injuries before or are maybe coming to the end of their end of their career compared to, you know, young and upcoming, you know, athletes in terms of how you deal with deal with treatment there? Because I know from, you know, there's there's always that mindset surrounding it of uh, depending on the personality, on the sport, maybe even on the on the position of you know spending a little bit longer to look after yourself, or thinking, oh, it'll be all right. I'll just I'll just get this done and then and, and then move move on from there. What sort of your experience has has been of that? Yeah, I think the I, I think I think there's still there's two types of players in ball camps. There even with the young players, there can be some of them that can be quite needy um, and almost entitled, whereas some of them are great. They'll just get on with things. And then on the older ones, there, there's some as well that they'll, they'll get on with. Like, so, you know, like Jamie Peacock, and you, you probably know him from, from Leeds, right? He was a player that just, you know, came in, got on with it. Like if he came in looking for physio, I was like, shit, there must be something wrong with him here. And then, you know, as, as he got on towards the end of his career, just chatting to, to Andy, the, the physio who was there at the time, that it was a case of, you know, he knew what he needed to do to get right. Not much input, Hands on wise, just knew what he needed. And, you know, Brent Webb, I don't know, do you remember him? He was a full back for Leeds yeah. at the time. And he was funny, like he, towards the end of his career, he needed to come in an hour before training just to train. You know, he was just like to, to get going and stuff like that. And, and they got into their routines and, and they, as I said, they did kind of they, they do it. And then if they needed that little bit of an extra help, then, then we, we would give them it. Um, but you always have your one or two players who are just very passive, lazy and, and I want everything doing for them. And I think that's the bit where it, they, yeah, they, they 100% can be difficult to manage, but I think that's the benefit of me doing treating the way I treat where it's, yeah, do a little bit, right. Get up, do these exercises. They'll feel the difference with the exercise. And I think that's really important is it's all well and good saying, oh, this player's lazy and he just wants hands-on treatment. But what I found even with those players is when you give them a couple of bits to do, if they feel the difference that the exercise makes, it goes back to what we said at the start. You'll get the buy-in. They'll feel good from the exercise and, and you will start to wean them off. And then it's a case of, right, have you done your stuff that I showed you? No, right, do that now, then come back to me. So you, there, there's a bit there. You, you have to be able to get results with your exercises. Your exercises have to be effective. They have to feel the difference. That's one way to, to deal with, with those types of, um, of of athletes as well. And and I think on the other hand, you know, we have a responsibility as therapists as well where Sometimes it's just easy to appease them. Um, and it's it's a lot actually less work for us to actually just get them on the bed and go through the motions, you know, and have a chat with them rather than actually coach them. You know, it, it probably takes more energy to coach them. No, no, you're doing it wrong. Do this, 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 you know. And um, like Rob Burrow, he's obviously, you know, quite in the news these days. And like, you know, we had a running joke with him, like at the time is, you know, you had to tell Rob less of, 10 times like to do something yeah yeah got it no no rob do this yeah yeah got it do that so you know there, there could be you know you, you expend a lot of energy coaching as well and, and getting them right so I, I think there's 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 probably a bit of that as well sometimes i said it's just easier just to do the hands-on with them you know if you you come in hung over or you're, you're you're tired or something like that you know just dry needle them i used to joke in, in monster you know every monday morning everyone was getting dry needles because i was coming in hung over um but uh but yeah so so I think that there's all, you know, it's very multifactorial. I think all that stuff, but I think the short answer is if we can give them exercises that they feel a difference straight away, that they feel good after, and the gains, um, the gains last, then they'll they'll buy into that. Usually, from my experience. Yeah, you mentioned there, it kind of came, you know, you know, full full circle, uh, you know, around there from what we, you know, very first said at the start, and you know, following that plan, and you know, getting getting buy in from them, and ultimately, you know, getting getting results, and kind of the uh, the the to round up from there, going back to you know the the mentoring that you do and the the, the physios that you work with, and you know, building confidence in athletes whenever they're injured and trying to get back for that, which I think is really important, and getting buy in. Is it a case of, for, you know, any physios listening or coaches listening for that example there in terms of, you know, building those relationships, where investing in that 
and then the knowledge and experience of you know what exercises they need to do you know the the knowledge of the of the nervous system all those all those sort of things that can still be ticking over in the background but the priority is building that relationship and first of all getting buy-in and then the results will 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 come from there because i know sometimes we've touched on it all the way through of you know having quick fixes you know trying to appease them and and, and all the and all these other things is that kind of like the the thought process that you do with the with the mentoring that you deliver yeah it's a, another good question so i think the, the, the first thing that has to happen before you can get the buy-in with the, the athlete is, is you really need to understand why you're doing things. Um, and I think that's, you know, it holds true whether it's a physio or a strength coach is it's really understanding the why behind everything you're doing. You know, we use that phrase a lot um, with our, you know, on our, our pages and stuff like that. And if you understand why you're doing things, you're going to have a lot more clarity then your explanation to the to the athlete is going to be a lot, lot better. If you don't really understand why you're doing something, you're trying to explain it, they'll smell bullshit every time. And your physiology, your tone of voice, it'll, it'll completely change. You know, I've seen that with physios. I've seen that myself. Sometimes I'm yeah. like, fuck, I have no idea where I'm going here. <laughs> um, and your voice goes squeaky. But um, so I think that's the first step is, and, and then that goes back one step further. How you do that is, you know, which we've t- kind of talked on a principle level today rather than tactics. And I think that's so important is, is people, you know, and, and that was probably your first question is these short-term fixes. These are tactics. They're not principles. And if you, you live by principles, you know, you're, you're not going to go too far wrong. And, and if you start understanding principles, then you've got that wiggle room to, to make things specific to the person in front of you while still adhering to your principles. And, and that's how I try teaching the mentorship is these are the principles you take all the courses you've done, but once you adhere to the principles, you're going to be absolutely, you're going to be able to use all of those techniques and, and all these, these courses you've done, you can be able to use them with the mentorship system. And, and that ultimately comes back then to having the structure in going, right, this is where we are, this is where we need to get to, you know? So, and as I said, you know, it's, it's going to be some kind of, um, you know, lunge, squat, hop, but it's in what plane of motion and it's what we have to do ever so slightly to get load and show the nervous system it's safe to tolerate load. It's those little bits that's specific to the person in front of you. And unless you understand the principle there and you, you try that tactic of the same exercise for everybody, that's probably, you know, you alluded to McGill and stuff. That's probably where it might work for one, but it probably won't work for two. So you, you, they need something else as well as that. Um, and it wasn't the exercise that was wrong. It was more the, the um, it just wasn't used at the right time. You know, and that's another big thing I see as well is actually they, they just weren't ready for that. Or you've skipped a couple of steps. You tried to use it too early or, or maybe even too, too late, you know? Yeah, definitely. And you've touched on it a couple of times from the experiences that you've had. Sometimes it is a case of, you know, making these mistakes to, to learn from it. And that's how you gain experience and, and, and develop from there. Because, you know, everything that we've chatted about, no one's going to get it right, you know, st- straight away. But that's where, you know, having a, having a mentor, having, you know, influences you know, on how you deliver things. That's how you learn and develop and, and, and get better. You know, it's not a case of, you know, being the same, knowing the same stuff that you knew when you very first started compared to, you know, where, where you are now. You know, it's a process you've got you've got to de- develop through. Um, probably the last question that I, that I like to ask then, quite a few uh, topics and, and tangents thrown in there, but what would be your take-home points or, or words of wisdom for everyone listening? Um, I think it's, yeah, it's get really clear on the destination where, where they want to get to. Even, and even if, it, if that's, you know, fat la- loss, like if they're working with a client for fat, fat loss, it's, you know, why do they want to lose the weight? What's the internal motivator that's driving them? And, and how can we make that their program specific to them so that we're really clear on where they, they want to get back to? And then it goes back to just what we touched on, understand why you're doing things, where it fits in your structure. And, you know, like you said there, like I still fuck up sometimes. I still flare flare guys up and I put them back too quickly because I'm rushing and, I, and I'm and i taking a little bit of a risk, but I fuck up less and less nowadays because of the structure and the system and the experiences, you know, that that I that I have and, and I can see where everything fits together. So I think it's, it's, you know, as I said, figure out the principles you want to live by the structure in your system and just get better and better at, at doing that. I think that's the key thing rather than the tactics. And 
learning off a couple of quick fixes it's um you know as i said you, you know you, you're you're going to get found out and it, it might look good on on social media but when there's a person coming in and, and they're handing over money it's you know and coming back to you the next week or they're not coming back and they're bad your reputation that uh it's uh that's not a good place to to be as a as a coach but i think if you can understand what you're doing you simplify things and you can get results then you you know you'll never be out of business will you you know and i always yeah, said about yeah. physios if, if you're good at what you do you'll, you'll never be out of work yeah i think that's a good point to finish on and it's one of the, it's one of those things where it's like you know as you as you refine things you know on and on it's similar to when we talked about sort of like injury prevention there you're never gonna you know injuries are never going to go completely there's always going to be you know people are going to get injured but it's the same as like what you said there i still have a few fuck ups now you know however you want to get you want to get them less and less and put that you know biggest foundation in there to be like right if it does happen what did i miss out of that system what did what did i need not what did i need to do properly or like what we said right at the start the mentors and the other people who have you know influenced your career or you know that support network that you've got what do you think about this? What did you try? Oh, well, I had a similar case like this and this is this, this, this is what I did, you know, so that, again, you know, that common theme that we had throughout the chat of, you know, the results speak at the end of the day. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to, to jump on there. I really enjoyed that, the, the, the conversation and the uh, tangents that we went on there. Um, but for everyone listening who might have any questions about what we've chatted about today, um, have a look at the content that you put out there or even get involved in the you know mentorship program that, that, that you run. Where can people find you or get in touch with you? Yeah, the, the website's uh, the go to physio.com. So T H E go to physio.com. Uh, that's our site. So we've got quite a few resources there. There's like a shoulder return to play uh, course you can get access to there for a couple of weeks free. Um, my Instagram, I'm shocked. I don't even know the Instagram. I think it's Dave O'Sullivan Physio. Uh, I think that's it. Um, but you, you can put on the show notes maybe. <laughs> um, we Yeah, we do put a lot of stuff on Instagram. Um, and not that uh, active on Twitter and stuff. Our Facebook page is, is quite, quite active. So probably Instagram is probably, there, there's fresh kind of content that we take a lot of our videos and we, we we kind of repurpose them on Instagram. So you, you'll probably get a lot of bits and pieces there as well. So it's probably worth checking that out. Awesome. Yeah. For everyone listening, um, I'll be putting up all the, the links to the, the website and Instagram page. So hundred percent, you know, check out the, the content that Dave puts out there. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to jump on. Thanks a lot to everyone listening and I will see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers, Stephen. <laughs>